So we have seen that Lewis has gone to great lengths to show that from a scientific or logical perspective, miracles are perfectly possible, even in a nature that is created by God to be perfect. There are no, no violations of laws when miracles occur. But there's another perspective that even a believer in God might want to take to show that miracles are still not proper of God. And that's from the perspective of God's workmanship. And there's two ways you can look at that. You can look at it from the perspective of function or the mechanical perspective, or you can look at it from the perspective of aesthetics or beauty or art. And either way, you could say, well, if God is perfect, then God would make something that doesn't need to be tampered with, right? So nature, therefore, if God exists, is perfect. God has created it for a function, and it perfectly fulfills its function. Otherwise, God has some imperfection. But miracles are signs of what? External tampering. It's kind of like a computer program who writes a program and then has to rewrite certain parts of the code later on. What's that a sign of? The sign is, is that the original code of the program wasn't good enough. It needed to be tampered with. And so the argument goes that miracles, as by definition, are rewritings of the code. They're tampering with a system in order to get it to work the way it's supposed to work, which means, therefore, that miracles are signs of imperfections and poor workmanship. But since God is perfect, then he wouldn't need to do that, and so, therefore, miracles are impossible. And that's the first perspective. The second is an artistic perspective, and the idea behind this is that, obviously, since God is this highest master craftsman and artist, then whatever God creates is going to have the highest amount of internal harmony and beauty and coherence. And nature should be a work like that. But if God has to go in and patch things up with supernatural occurrences, then that's a sign of the artistic poverty of God's work of creation. And so miracles point to a lack of consistency. They're kind of like patches. Often the argument comes as the idea of that miracles are what are called deus ex machina. Now, a deus ex machina is just Latin for meaning God out of the machine. It's an old kind of trick that would occur in plays back in the Renaissance and in early eras where they would have a crane and you would have a story and the story would get so muddled that you would put your main characters in this impossible situation. And then the only way to get them out of them is to have God come save them. And so it seems a lot, a lot of times like miracles are like that, right? You, you have the main character in the New Testament is Jesus. And Jesus get, has gotten into this impossible situation. The hero is going to die. And so what does God come and do and resurrect him, right? And it, it just seems like this artificial patch that's not believable and therefore disrupts and hurts the internal harmony of the entire story of nature. Miracles are like these artificial patches. And we can see how that works, right? I mean, how many of you have watched movies like Mission Impossible? And it's, it's well named, right? Because too many things that happen in that are impossible. There's no way the main character could do what they make that character do, Tom Cruise, in the story, like outrun an explosion. How many have seen that in movies, right, where all of a sudden there's an explosion and the character somehow runs and outruns the fire of the explosion and the force of the explosion and outruns even the thrown objects from that explosion. And you ask yourself, wow, what man, what human being could do something like that, but somehow they're able to do that. That's just a sign of poor workmanship in the movie, isn't it? So, Lewis says, these are based on misunderstandings of the story, in fact. Let's start, for example, with the idea of the mechanical problem, that somehow miracles are fixes to nature and therefore show us that nature itself isn't working properly and that it needs God to come in and tamper it and rewrite the code. 
The problem with that kind of argument is it depends on this idea that we have perfect knowledge of what nature is all about and what its function is for. And therefore, we then define miracles as these interferences rather than interactions. Because the word interference itself is, is a negative term, isn't it? It, it? It's saying disrupting the normal operation of something. Whereas sometimes the word interference just means what? Interaction so that what's going on on its own now is different. So what if nature is not a solo act? What if nature isn't like a perpetual motion machine? Because that's the picture that you often see is nature is like this clock that you wind up and that it, now it starts to run down, God's got to rewind it. And of course that makes this idea of imperfection. Why couldn't God make it in perpetual motion? But that assumes that nature is like that. What if nature is instead like a plug and an outlet? To give you an illustration, take a look at this plug. Now I'm not trying to plug this particular company. Sorry, I had to put the pun in there for my friends. But if you notice, this thing has holes in it. Now you might look at this and say stupidly, wow, what a terrible piece of workmanship because it's got three holes in it. There are gaps in it. It's just not functioning properly. No, in fact, if this thing stood alone and nothing interfered with it and went into it and interacted with it, then it would be malfunctioning. Then it wouldn't be fulfilling its purpose. How do we know that nature isn't like an outlet and God, like the plug that is meant to bond with nature from the outside, so that what we have is not a solo act, but a duet. If we don't know this, then we can't say from the outset that because miracles are external influences, that therefore miracles are interferences with nature. If nature is meant to be influenced, if nature, just like this plug, is meant to be invaded, then it follows that miracles are not only not signs of imperfection, but their non-occurrence would be an imperfection, just like the non-occurrence of the plug in the outlet would be a sign of this thing not being used to its full potential. So that's his answer that he's giving for the question of mechanical interference. We don't know that miracles aren't the dancer that's the lead dancer, the supernatural dancer. We don't know that nature isn't the harmony that then is the second string player in the main drama of life. So you notice how I'm shifting now to artistic because the whole idea of a deus ex machina depends on the story, doesn't it? So let's go back to that Mission Impossible stuff, right? The reason why I find Mission Impossible so unbelievable is precisely because Tom Cruise, the agent, is not supposed to be a superhero. He's supposed to be an ordinary person. And therefore, it follows that if an explosion occurs next to him, he's not going to be able to outrun it. And if you make in the story the ability for him to outrun it and not be injured, for him to fall out of a helicopter and not be injured and continue to fight as if everything was good before, then it's unbelievable. That's a deus ex machina. But if we have Spider-Man fighting Mysterio or superheroes fighting each other, Thor fighting Hulk, then that same scenario would be more believable because you're starting off with a story about beings that have more than natural, extraordinary powers. If you have the flash outrunning an explosion, that's believable because that's part of the story, that he has these supernatural powers. So really it depends on what the story is about before you start accusing miracles of being disruptions of the harmony. You have to ask the question, what is the story about? Excuse me. And so, we have to ask ourselves, what is the story about? When the resurrection occurs for Jesus, is the story about death and resurrection? If it is, if the story of nature is about death and resurrection, then resurrection becomes not only 
something that doesn't disrupt the story becomes the climax of the story. And so, we can't say that miracles point to a lack of internal harmony until we understand the work as a whole. We can't, he gave a good example in literature with the breaking of rules for poetry. Some of you who have read Shakespeare know that Shakespeare invented a new type of sonnet. And that's why it's called the Shakespearean sonnet. A sonnet is a 14-line poem, and it typically, when it was first invented by Petrarch, it had a certain kind of rhyme scheme in the first eight lines. And the rhyme scheme could be represented as Abba, Abba. And then you had, you had the eight lines, and then you had six lines. Now, this is your typical Petrarchan sonnet. And what happens is Shakespeare starts writing sonnets and he violates that rule. Instead, he adapts an A B A B scheme, A B A B rhyme scheme. And also, he violated the Petrarchan sonnet in another way. In the Petrarchan sonnet, you had what is called a volta. That's the sudden turn. There would be a certain logic going to the poem, the first eight lines, and then the last six, you would have a turn in the logic of the poem. What you have in Shakespeare is two turns. So you would have almost a dialogue in the Shakespearean sonnet. You would have that first line of logic, then you would have the, a turn and then another turn. And so thus, those who were reading Shakespearean sonnets at the time that he's writing it would then say, oh, Shakespeare is breaking all of the rules of writing a good sonnet. But why was he a master artist? Because he didn't break the rules. He, in fact, changed the rules so that he actually, in the breaking of them, made a greater harmony. And a harmony, a harmony that actually then superseded the Petrarchan harmony and therefore was better for the English language because Petrarch was written originally in Italian. So thus what we see is when looked at from a certain perspective, a breaking of rules isn't a breaking of rules. It's actually a tying together of things into a higher harmony that wouldn't have been possible without seeming to break these rules. We don't know miracles aren't like that. We are in the middle of the story, aren't we? And we don't know what the whole story is about because we have been in such a little part of the story that we can't be good judges of the total artistic nature of the work. If you don't know what the story is about, then you can't judge it, can you? And you then don't know whether miracles, precisely because they seem to be exceptions, are breakings of rules or disruptions of harmony, or are they perfectly permissible such that if they didn't occur, then the work wouldn't be as good without them? And so, therefore, the whole idea that miracles are somehow representative of disharmony and imperfection all depend on ignorance of the total picture. And since these are arguments about the possibility of miracles, then we can't use that kind of argument. What we're going to see in our next segment is even so, we still might say miracles are highly improbable. That from what we know, it will always be more irrational to believe that a miracle occurred than that the na some natural explanation is a better explanation.